Note on dating, as indicated in the preface, the dates assigned to passages in the translation are tentative merely and not professed to be a final solution of the problem of the chronology of the Quran, as however they differ both from the traditional dating and from that most accepted by European scholars, it seems necessary to give some indication of the grounds on which they have been suggested. Naldek's chronological arrangement of the suwar was taken as the starting point. This was first modified by the recognition that the suwar were themselves more complex than Naldek had allowed for. And part of that, I'm without reading further, we can probably, well, I will read further, uh, probably indicate the simple fact that um, there's so many narrations about this verse being placed in between this verse and this verse and the orders of the chapters being according to, you know. Now, some people have looked at the general uh, things. It's like, well, in this prayer, he said this chapter before this chapter. Well, almost always that was the case, but the, there was not the rule of that you have to recite the Quran in order from one part of the prayer to the other. Um, you just don't arbitrarily mix it up, right? In the Sawar, which he assigned to the Medinan period, where there are a sufficient number of events, reasonably well fixed in date, divergences are mainly due to this cause, though here and there, my interpretation of a passage and its reference may have differed from his. In particular, it seemed to me clear that the use of the epithet Manafiktin had its origin in the conduct of those who distrusted Muhammad's policy at the time of the Battle of Uhud, and that all passages in which the word occurred must be later than that event, or at least have been revived at some time after it, a surmise which has been confirmed by study of the passages themselves. The first real shock to Noldek's chronology in my mind came from consideration of Muhammad's attitude to Christianity and dates from the time of its composition of my lectures on the origin of Islam. I then concluded that up to the time of the Hijra, Muhammad was favorably disposed to Christianity, of which he had only a vague knowledge and that it was only after he quarreled with the Jews in Medina that he acquired a more particular knowledge of its doctrines and included that in his antipathy. Well, we notice that it's not whether or not, as much as people say, oh, there's a couple narrations where he said, just uh, don't be like the Christians or don't be like the Jews. Um, so people take that out of context and try to pretend that Islam was just like some sort of ancient form of Satanism or something, right? Um, but no, it wasn't. It didn't matter whether the polytheists even believed or disbelieved or did or didn't do something. It was, you know, deeper than that, right? Um, it was about the revelation, what he, what he, what he experienced, you know. Further study the Quran has on the whole confirmed that position, though on that subject obscurity still remain, sure ground was found in a study of the development of his estrangement from the Jews, especially in the first part of Surah 2. Here, we can almost watch the transformation of the man who thought he was preaching to the Arabs the religion which had been revealed to other peoples into the independent prophet of a renewed parallel and finally paramount religion. Snook Hergronje had already recognized that the adoption of the religion of Abraham belonged to that this period. With this is associated the use of the term Hanif. Further, it appeared to me evident that it was the stress of finding a new foothold that he fell back upon. Islam surrendered to God and obedience to his revealed word and the basal element in all religion. And therefore the terms Islam and Muslim belong to this and subsequent periods. And the term Hanif is referred to the Muslim world, volume 20, page 120. Okay. Um, but we find that Muhammad 
believe uh, that before he was a prophet, thought, well, Abraham might be the thing, but, you know, the, Abraham's religion wasn't there. It was obvious. Um, wasn't quite the thing, but he, he just didn't know what. So he just supplicated with and meditated without further guidance, you could say, until his, he started having visions of light and that sort of thing. But um, the use of many specifically Jewish words and phrases belongs also, as other scholars have recognized, to the early Medinian period. All this has led to transference to Medina of a great many passages which Snoldek assigned to Mecca. Now, doesn't the Talmud say that the followers of Solomon were called Muslim? Um, and so, uh, you know, pre-Arabic, you have very, very similar terms in Semitic languages or the same thing. And nobody in the right minds uh, saying that you know, all this assigned to transfer to Medina, a great many passages of Snoldic assigned to Mecca. Okay. Uh, yeah, a lot of the, uh, you know, you can't just say, well, that's this subject, so it's Medina, Mecca, and um, it's not quite as simple as that. But, you know, when when has a prophet ever been the individual to, like, lay forth the language, you could say? Now, a scripture can be so eloquent that it becomes, like, the model for literary types or, or whatever, but um, the idea that a prophet just came and taught people language, um, it just doesn't quite make sense. I, I've shared how I have my own dream language and that sort of thing, but I, I'm not saying I'm a prophet that other people have to accept. That's, you know, it's a different thing. Um, and, and really people have to, uh, uh, calling a, a prophet's being called because, well, they're, they're just so weird that it's like, no. <laughs> um, the untrustworthiness of tradition leaves the Meccan period very obscure. Obscure. No, n not really. It's, it's name a modern figure that the tradition that can be objectively trusted by people who don't believe it um, as far as you know, now uh, what I'm saying, people who don't believe it, now they may not believe the mythological claims, but the idea that these things being transferred are what, you know, people really believe what was being passed on, you know. Naldek relied largely upon the criteria of style and phraseology, both of which are useful, but neither of which is decisive. There are indications in the Quran itself that different styles were used contemporaneously for different kinds of deliverances of chapter 47, verse 22. And it is inherently probable that Muhammad varied his style according to subject and the effect he aimed at producing. Now, if you hear it in Arabic, people listen to that as like, in his speaking of where he was supposed to convey ideas, he didn't do this. And... I mean, who can do that? You, you find you find the sound change when you say it in Arabic in places like, you know, that dubstep thing without the, you know, per se cheesiness or whatnot of it is the sounds and mix and then they kind of, you know, change and you don't, you know, it hits you um, because you're following along in this way, but in this other way, the sound changes and um, And the effect he aimed at producing, as to as to phraseology, the analysis has brought out a few cases which the wording of a later passage was influenced by that of an earlier one, and this may have happened oftener than we can detect owing to the use of the Quran in pious recitation. It is only a decisive criterion when, as the above mentioned examples, we can appoint. To the occasion of the introduction of the word or phrase, but it is the useful guide to probability in otherwise doubtful cases. The most reliable chronology is that which relates the passages to the historical circumstances and to the development of Muhammad's religious ideas. In regard to the Meccan period, we are thrown back almost entirely upon the latter. Thus, we must gather from the Quran itself a process which, while it does not 
necessarily imply a vicious circle in our reasoning calls for the careful consideration and prolonged discussion, the view which I stated in my Origins of Islam, that he began as the advocate of a renewed religion of gratitude to the one supreme God that faced with unbelief and rejection, he enforced his message by the threat of punishment, first in the form of calamity following upon special unbelieving peoples, and that then as he acquired more knowledge of Christianity and Judaism, he substituted for are combined with this, that eschatological ideas of judgment to come and the punishments and rewards of the future life has been confirmed by further study. Well, the fact he wasn't anything new among the messengers isn't a surprise, but if people say that Muhammad invented the thing, this is obviously the sort of conclusions that are gonna make. Um, many details, however, remain obscure, and I've contented myself with indicating the Meccan origin of passages without venturing upon classing them as early and late. And um, Richard Bell's articles in the Muslim world, volume 24, page 13, 155, 330, and in the transactions of the Las Coic University Oriental Society, volume seven, page 16. Now, obviously that's old enough if I find a, if I find a copy of some of these things online, which not everything's available online, um, but you know that's that further study that was being talked about. And 